Well, welcome to Tri Scrum Studios webinar series. Um, every agilist know that or recognize the learning mindset is a virtue. Thank you for joining our webinar series. This is the second webinar series hosted by Tri Scrum in partnership with the different studios that we host. So we have Gunter on the line today. He is going to present engagement on the key. Before that, let me give you a little bit of a logistic information for people on the call. All your microphones would be muted in the main room. Your questions would be taken on the chat, given the fact that we have more than 100 people registered. So it's, it's best that we take some questions on the chat. We will decide when to take questions. Probably uh, Gunther might be presenting his whole webinar and we will see if the time box, uh, how much of time box we are left with. And based on that, we can accommodate as many questions that I, as we can. Um, and also we wanted to time box this event to one hour. So we will try to balance these two for today. And a little bit background about Tri-Scrum. Uh, most of you know, you would have registered this webinar series through Tri-Scrum. And our mission is to humanize organizations. This webinar is actually kickstarted to, to fulfill that vision by bringing world-class speakers from different uh, areas of expertise. And we are also a scrum.org direct PTN, and we are also an IC Agile member organization. We do a lot of offerings with respect to coaching, consulting, and training. For more information, please visit tristrum.com. And as many of you know, this, this webinar is sponsored or maybe powered in collaboration with the different studios we have in Tristrum. We have clearly separated, according to the audience interest, Scrum Master Studio, Product Owner Studio, and Agile Leadership Studio to specifically focus on different uh, expectations of uh, different groups. And this webinar is particularly hosted from Scrum Master Studio uh, in, in collaboration with some of the world-class speakers. And I would also like to quickly introduce the minds behind this webinar. You could see the different people that are there doing a lot of background information and background work to make this webinar successful. And I quickly introduce Aaron, he is an employee of Tri-Scrum, he is working with the different offerings and he is also delivering stuff. Venkatrao taking care of people part, specifically on Scrum Master Studio. And Ramana that takes care of Product Owner Studio on the product part. Rakshit, who is from Bengaluru, takes care of people part. Kiran, who recently joined Product Owner Studio, he is also a product owner himself. And myself, most of you know if you have registered for this webinar. My name is Venkatesh, I'm the founder of Tri-Scrum.com and I'm trying to I'm really delighted to host a series of webinar. And with no delays, I would like to quickly introduce Hunter. Uh, I think Hunter needs no introduction. Author, speaker, scrum caretaker, and also uh, a person who is really, really contributing and gave a lot of stuff to the community. Uh, he has uh, published so far a couple of books in my knowledge, a scrum pocket guide, and recently has published 97 things that every scrum practitioner should know. And I have started reading that book. It's really, really a collection of wisdom from many people. Thank you so much for uh, that book, Gunther. Without any further delays, I would like to hand it over to Gunther uh, to take on. Okay. So uh, thank you, Venkat and uh, Arun and all the people from Triscrum. And uh, glad to see so many people joining. So that's, that's good because... Uh, I've started to grow some doubts because I've been in so many webinars that I've been doubting whether I will still attract some people or not. So I'm sort of very happy to see that still some people are still there and, and even people joining multiple sessions. Now, the advantage of having done so many webinars is that um, as, as far as the topic is concerned, I'm going to mix a lot of things. So into uh, people that have followed me around still have some new things to, to learn about. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, I'm going to mix in what Venkatesh just uh, showed, so uh, some articles from my new book, 97 things every Scrum practitioner should know. And it's like uh, Venk, uh, like you said, it's a collection of uh, 97 essays by uh, no less than besides me, 68 people uh, from around the world. And, and uh, it's all revolving around Scrum. So it's not about organizations, it's not about specific commercial, whatever viewpoints, it's not about being a trainer, not a training and for what it's just all people with a passion for Scrum. So I'm going to try to mix in uh, and read two articles from that. I've done several reading sessions, so I know that about every article takes about 10 minutes. Uh, but I, I've, the, the main line that I want to use for my presentation is a paper that I published recently. 
I haven't talked about it uh, too much, so this is sort of a scoop for you guys. It's called moving your Scrum uh, downfield. And, and in between, I will probably like Vink said, I got this little book out and it's actually really little. Let, let me show you how little it actually is, you see. So it's actually little, it's a pocket guide, means you can take it along everywhere you want. I've seen people taking it on the train, the bus, uh, public transport, cars, flights, planes, whatever. And then it gets all messed up and they're so proud of it. And it's full of notes and post-its and so on. So it's, it's a living thing. I like that. That's, that's good. So I'll, I'll probably mix in some stuff from that over there. Yeah. So, so um, certainly moving your scrum downfield. So I've uh, made a little presentation uh, for you guys too. Um, why did I write this thing, moving your scrum downfield? Um, like, like Frank had uh, just said, I, I call myself indeed an independent scrum caretaker. And uh, what is it that I do? I, 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 I want to like, and that's much in line with uh, Tri Scrum's uh, ambition and mission. I want to uh, use scrum to humanize the workplace. So it's, it's, it's not just about Scrum, it's also about the, mainly about a lot about the people aspect of Scrum. So not just using Scrum to build better products, but to create more humanized workplaces where people feel better. And in that sense, we'll produce and, and create better products. So that's uh, how I started calling myself. And that's only like about four years ago when I uh, went fully independent. Before that, I had spent three years working at Scrum.org together with uh, Ken Schreiber. Um, and, and the funny thing about this is this, this sounds maybe very obvious and, and it seems to resonate with a lot of people. And, and I, I like to think that this is why I was born. This is why I was put on this world. But I, I can't say this was really like it's sort of childhood dream. It's just something that along the road I discovered. So, um, I started with, with Scrum and Agile and, and partly with Extreme Programming back in 2003. And after some great results, working with brilliant people, great teams, in 2007, some people started pointing out things to me that sort of, oh yeah, this is, and, and at the heart of everything I do is people. It's not just Scrum, not just, it's people. And what I also discovered that uh, besides me saying that this is why I was put on this world, it's not really true. It's something I discovered along the road. So I, I'm, I turned 50 this year. That's why I have all these gray hairs and so on. Um, and this is something I just discovered along the road. What drives me, what really, really drives me and motivates me. So that's, that's why I've got this little box, that picture. That's a, a box I've got on, on, on the wall in my home desk over here. It's over there next to the door. I put it, I put it on the wall. I, I glued it on the wall just to regularly remind me that um, we can sit around for days, months, years, decades, uh, hoping that at some magical time we will discover who we are. That won't happen. You have to create yourself. You have to work for it. So, so that's, that's why I like about that little statement. Life is not about finding yourself because you can get stuck waiting for uh, your purpose to arrive at you for the rest of your days. Life is about creating and, and sort of discovering yourself. And, and the reason why I wrote that paper, Moving Your Scrum Downfield, is, is connected to that, to that purpose. There were actually two main reasons why I, I created that. First of all, what I see happening, I've, and I'm, I'm sort of assuming that it's happening in, in many places around the world, so not just in where I mainly work and live in Europe. Um, I see more and more people getting into Scrum, wanting to know about Scrum, finding out about Scrum, introducing, adopting Scrum that are not in the traditional software IT and new product development uh, domains. Meaning they work in organizations that are not just, de not just not dependent on IT software, but not even on real let's say traditional products, not even technology products. Think in terms like education, youth care, child care organizations, uh, uh, government uh, organizations and so on. So they, they don't build traditional products. And what I've noticed in my, in my classes and the courses where they come to find out about Scrum is that uh, the traditional terminology that we use is still very it -ish releasing, uh, development, and so on. So I wanted, first of all, I wanted to create something to better connect with people that are not in IT and software development. 
Next to that, um, so Scrum is expanding in non-IT or non-software development uh, domains where it actually has its roots, let's be honest, that it's, it's, it completely grew up in those domains. And, and it's growing outside of those domains, but even within those, let's say, traditional domains of Scrum, it's Scrum just keeps expanding. It's, it's, it's quite incredible. Uh, so it keeps growing more and more people, more and more teams, more and more organizations adopting Scrum, even still in IT and software development. But what I've noticed with both groups, but certainly with the people in IT and, and, and new product development, um, they often, if not very regularly, seem to get stuck at interpreting the words and, and the terms and the whatever uh, little signs that we seem to be using in the Scrum Guide. So they, they try to, they, they get stuck in over interpreting the rules of Scrum. So I wanted to create something that is, in that sense, more like even smaller than the Scrum Guide, uh, steps away from the very uh, traditional uh, terminology even, and that resonates with more people. Also the people that want to, what I call, up your game. That, that's why I called it moving your Scrum downfield. It's about time that we start moving our Scrum downfield, where our op opponent is um, rigidity rigid behaviors, rigid processes, and so on. That's still very, very, very um, present in most organizations. So it's, it's time to do more with Scrum. And I wanted to help people see beyond just the, the literal interpretation of the rules. I wanted to help people, help people see what, what, what is it that actually makes Scrum work. So beyond or even underneath the rules. And, and those are the six things I came up with. First of all, the simplicity of Scrum. So Scrum is simple yet sufficient, meaning Scrum as a framework has all it takes. Uh, but I'll come back on that, but it, it is sufficient. It's, it's, it's got all in it to tackle uh, complexity. And I don't know how many people were last week in the session with Dave Snowden, but I'm very sure that he completely submerged you into complexity thinking. Um, and the second one is Scrum's DNA. Um, what is it that makes Scrum work? Beyond the rules, um, knowing what, what the, the, the DNA of Scrum is and how that is, should be sort of in your game, in the way that you play your game. And that reminds me this week, um, somebody on LinkedIn asked me, can you follow Scrum? Can you do Scrum and not really be agile according to the Agile Manifesto? And unfortunately, that is possible. You can do some sort of rigid um, implementation of Scrum meaning not uh, following or living upon Scrum's DNA. And the third one is players demonstrating accountability, transparency for the flow, closing the loops, very important, and ultimately, obviously, the Scrum values. So let me go through them. And in the meantime, I'll, I'll try to mix in some things from what I've been talking about a lot lately, engagement being the key. I've got some stuff from that. I've got some stuff from my book. And, and let's see if we can make this a sort of exciting session soon. And, and uh, all of my co-hosts in the meantime will be looking at possible answers that you put into the Q&A window. And if they have something that is really a great question, they, uh, they will gently and respectfully interrupt me. So that's good. So that we don't pile up questions until the end, which is a waterfall thinking. Let's, let's, let's not do that. So Scrum is simple yet sufficient in, in my paper. This is sort of the definition I've used to build my paper upon, meaning Scrum being a simple framework that enables people to derive value from complex challenges. I have this little tendency to create really dense sentences with a, a lot of meaning and layers in, in a rather limited set of words. What for me important is in, in that definition I, I'm using, is that it has people in it, which I'm missing a lot of definitions. So it's about people, it's to help people, it's supporting people, enabling people. And it's about value. And, and value is a very different purpose than volume is. So a lot of people are still stuck in the idea of using Scrum to produce more and more amounts of this and more features and so on. That is not the same as value. Volume and value are very different purposes. And they give a very different um, sense of doing Scrum. You can do Scrum to create more value or Scrum to build more volume. And that's very different. 
And then obviously the, the beautiful um, connection between why are we doing Scrum? Because we want to drive value. Uh, why? Because we have complex challenges. So our world is highly complex. The product that we build is complex. The services that we deliver are complex, whether that's youth services, child services, governmental things, education, or, or traditional IT software development and new product development. Uh, and, and most of those services, products that we need to deliver are complex, and we have to do that in often very complex circumstances. So it's full of complexity. And that's, that's where the simplicity of Scrum uh, fits in. Scrum is a simple set of tools. So the ambition of Scrum is not to pretend that your challenges, challenges are not complex because they are and they will always be. They will always be highly unpredictable with a lot of uncertainties. So the goal of Scrum is not to pretend as if there are no uncertainties, as if anything is now predictable. No, the goal of Scrum is to provide you a, a simple, a lightweight tool set to approach those problems. And, and, and that simplicity of Scrum, I've tried to uh, summarize that in uh, what is over there, what I call Scrum in a nutshell. And, and allow me, it's, it's also in the paper, allow me to quickly read that for you. So Scrum in a nutshell means you have a Scrum master who fosters an environment where repeatedly the following happens. A product owner, it's so one accountability, orders functions and solutions for value against an overarching product vision. That's in product backlog, obviously, but I want to skip that part a little bit. And then we have a scrum team creating valuable increments of work against an overarching sprint goal. So we have two expressions of visions or goal at the product level and at the sprint level. We got a product owner accountable for the one and a scrum team accountable for the next one. And all players involved so I, I, I like to, to use and reuse the term players all the time. I've used it in my little book, so Scrum a Pocket Guide. Um, it builds on the idea of the new, new product development, where we also have the name Scrum from, from the game of rugby, so it's about players. So all players figure out how, figure out what to work on next and how to best organize for that collaboratively. That's, that's actually the, the, the tool set that Scrum is. This will help you tackle complexity, deal with complexity. This will make you more agile in that sense, increase your agility, your ability to uh, adapt and even not just adapt uh, to changes, but cause changes, which is a lot more important. Now, to be honest, in my paper, I've used uh, the term Scrum Team, where currently the Scrum Guide still says Development Team. It's, it's one of the struggles I'm finding in addressing people outside of IT and, and software and product development is how to have a name that resonates with them too. Because two problems, development as, develop, as in development team, for those people doesn't really resonate. That's one aspect. But even within um, the, the domains where Scrum has its roots, meaning IT, software development, new product development, people tend to still limit development way too much. Now, development comes from the new, new product development game, the paper from 1986. So it was always about product development. It was always about all the talents and skills needed to develop, sustain, and maintain products. But it's often not seen like that. Um, so I, I made a choice in this paper to replace development team with Scrum team. And it's based on, again, that sports metaphor and uh, I, I, I'm hoping that we have some people from Chennai uh, on the call. So I hope you would recognize the cricket team from Chennai over there. Um, if, we, if, if I would show you a picture of, of the cricket team, not the coaches, not the managers, not the, the, the physiotherapy, whatever, just the team, you would still call that a cricket team. And that's where my analogy of scrum team sort of, sort of comes from. It's the people on the field. Uh, figuring out tactics, um, fighting that opponent of rigidity and, and unpredictability. And, and I have not used a term to, for the combination of the three roles. Yeah? Now that's, one, that's sort of my view. I hope, I hope that Scrum goes in that direction. But that's just some background if you would read the paper and you can find it on my, on my website if you want. But that's one thing. Let, let me now uh, share with you an article from Ken Schrader from uh, the 97 things every Scrum practitioner should know. That is all about that. 
that uh, idea of the simplicity of Scrum. Cool. Are ready for it? So and and that's from so the book ninety seven things I I've, I've um, grouped ninety seven articles into uh, several themes and this is from team one actually part one it's called um, start adopt repeat saying that Scrum is not just a one time adoption effort you have to reconsider it regularly now here's what Scrum ha uh, Ken Schreiber had to say so Scrum is simple just use it as is. Scrum is a mindset, an approach to turning complex, chaotic problems into something that can be used. Jeff Sutherland and I based it on these pillars, small, self-organizing, self-managing teams, lean principles, and third one, empiricism, using frequent inspection and adaptation to guide the work of the teams to the most successful outcome possible. Now, a little secret, you will see aspect one and, and, and aspect three coming back in, in what I will share with Scrum's DNA. Ken goes on to say, the Scrum Guide is a body of knowledge that explicitly defines what Scrum is and by default, what it isn't. So the Scrum Guide doesn't tell you how to use Scrum, how to implement Scrum, or how to build products with Scrum. Again, that's where a lot of people fight with. The fact that Scrum provides you with a framework, a simple tool set, but there's a lot that you still need to do for yourself. Like use your creativity, use your brains, use your uh, imagination. People learned what Scrum was and how to use it by taking courses, going to conferences, reading books and blogs, and so on. But, primarily by trying to create useful things from visions, concepts, and designs using their understanding of Scrum. As they went at it, Scrum started to make sense. Scrum helped them manage outcomes. But when people tried to use Scrum, they learned that the difficulty of Scrum was getting a shared understanding of what was desired what was possible and what their skills would allow them to create and to work together to do their best. In 2009, so Ken says, I recognized that we had broken the waterfall mold. People understood largely that our agile, lightweight approach worked and was appropriate for the emerging complexity in the world. However, just like the telephone tag came, there were many interpretations of Scrum. Sometimes this was because of poor communication, inadequate mentoring, or other commercial reasons. People who felt that Scrum would tell them how to build a product to solve their needs, felt that Scrum was weak because it didn't explicitly tell them how. Exactly, as I've often said, Scrum is easy. Solving problems with Scrum is very hard. So in 2009, when I founded Scrum the Talk, I wrote a definition of Scrum. This was short, but retained all of Jeff's and my important thinking and learnings. I made sure that it retained Scrum's identity as a framework and skewed inclusion of opinions, context-dependent practices, and anything that constrained it to only certain applications. A framework, not a methodology. This was the first Scrum Guide, and it was the definitive body of knowledge. Anything not in the guide or contrary to the guide was not Scrum. Jeff Sutherland joined me to refine, sustain, and maintain it. The Scrum Guide was created from Jeff's and my work and the work of everyone else who had tried to use Scrum. We have adjusted it since then. The Scrum Guide has no commercial purpose other than to offer a litmus test of what Scrum is. Jeff and I are indebted to the people who have translated the guide and to those who help us sustain it. And very important conclusion by Ken, remember, Scrum is simple. 
stop worrying about polishing it up so it's perfect because it never will be. Anyway, there are far too many complex, chaotic situations in our world that you are skilled to help others address. We do not need to waste time staring at our belly buttons. So that, that, I think that's a beautiful explanation of the simplicity of Scrum. So, uh, and, and great to have an article by Ken in, uh, in my paper. So I hope that helped you see the simplicity of Scrum. Now in uh, the second aspect of uh, what is it that makes your Scrum work? So first of all, embracing the simplicity, not just accepting the simplicity, acknowledging, but really embracing it and using it in your advantage rather than getting stuck at adding rules and, and, and so on. So um, the next one, Scrum's DNA. Ken already said that it's uh, based on self-organizing teams, Scrum. Um, lean principles that are more uh, hidden in, in the framework, hidden or not so, uh, not so obvious always, and, and uh, empiricism, meaning empirical process control. So when I wrote my little book, Scrum a Pocket Guide, first version in 2013, and last year, 2019, an update was released, the second edition. I used the Scrum game board, again, game players, um, and, and I didn't want to just represent the official elements of Scrum. You know them all 11, right? So the, the artifacts, the roles, uh, the roles and the, uh, and the events. I also wanted to make people aware of some of the underlying principles of Scrum. And, and self-organization and empiricism or empirical process control is what I call Scrum's DNA. So that should be in the way you play Scrum. It should be ingrained. You should be full of that idea of inspection, adaptation, regularly stopping, reflecting, looking back, learning, adapting, doing something else, and so on. That's, that's one essence of Scrum. That is slowly becoming more and more accepted, I see, in organizations, because it's sort of process thing. Um, a lot of organizations, uh, even up to managers and so on, getting to see the idea of uh, inspection adaptation as a process. The, the second aspect of Scrum's DNA is a lot more difficult because it's also what Ken called self-organization. It's also much uh, described or giving much attention in the new new product development game. And, and that is where a lot of companies I see still struggle with. So I gave it more focus on in my paper than it actually has in the Scrum Guide because the Scrum Guide doesn't really go into self-organization that much. So I've created a definition for that. And that's for me the Scrum's DNA. Now, if you would look at my game board, you might wonder, yeah, but where's on the third principle, the shared visual workspace? Well, I've, I've connected that, still important. And again, something that is really missing in most organizations, a lack of a... Uh, let's say, uh, a customizable workspace. Teams not having a team space. And I've been focusing that a lot when I talked about engagement being the key. So engagement, or in Scrum terms, commitment, engagement being the key, means you first of all need to have an environment in place where people can actually engage, commit, work hard. It means that they need to have a workplace that they can organize for themselves, that they can decorate, where they can put stuff on the walls, where they can talk, where they can speak up, where they're not stuck in some sort of open office uh, environment, for instance. So uh, self-organization is probably not just most effective in such workplaces, I'm, I'm, I'm a gentle guy, but is actually totally needed. A workspace is needed for, uh, for people to truly be able to self-organize. So I'm hoping that over time people will recognize the potential, the need for self-organization more, and they go hand in hand. Like Scrum is about not just product, but also about people and engage people. Scrum is also not just about inspecting and adapting, but doing so via self-organization. They reinforce each other. So that's what I, I described in, in my paper. Now, in, in my paper, I called it also players demonstrate accountability. So again, it's about players. You recognize the players and then Scrum team as, as my name for development team for the time being. Um, but I, what I want to emphasize more is, it's not just about using the word accountability because uh, accountability can maybe people try to enforce or instruct or whatever accountability or hold other people accountable for their work or their results. 
the goal of Scrum and certainly of self-organization is to create an environment in which people, players, demonstrate accountability, sort of proactively show that they are accountable, that they take up accountability. Now, the accountabilities of the three roles are clear. Product owner optimizing the value delivered, creating done increment for the Scrum team, and Scrum Master facilitating the game as a sort of game master, but even a little more. Uh, what do they do as management activity, managing the product? So what needs to be done? Managing a sprint, meaning how certain aspects for the product uh, are going to be done, so the how. And then managing the environment, fostering an environment where people can engage, where people can commit, where people can self-organize, where people can actually show traditionally very unsafe behavior. Because unsafe behavior means speaking up, going into a constructive conflict, um, challenge, challenge each other's ideas, challenge each other's implementation, whatever, and then converts to a uh, committed uh, solution and committed way of working. So that's very unsafe behavior. If I look at most organizations, certainly where they have open offices, that looks like a very safe environment. But that's actually not what we're looking for. That's not the sort of safety. It's not that sort of perfect harmony, perfect silence. No, we want to have a buzz going through the room. That's, that's really important. And as those three core accountabilities of Scrum, so I'm, I'm trying to get over calling them roles because I've seen quite some organizations that turn them into official roles with uh, performance reviews and so on. That's not really helpful. Other organizations, um, or other as functions, other organizations see them like functions, roles, and it becomes something official. And then I'm like, yeah, but we're losing the idea that there's a clear accountability. So I started calling them more and more accountabilities. As those three accountabilities of Scrum start working together, collaborating, figuring out stuff, organizing works in sprints, so that's one of the boundaries to self-organization, the shared goal to create something uh, no later than by the end of sprint that, that creates some positive, constructive tension, which is good. As they start doing that, um, they should start reinventing, rethinking their relationships with people beyond them beyond a little ecosystem of Scrum, meaning certainly stakeholders and consumers. So stakeholders representing, stakeholders representing the organization to them and consumers, meaning users, buyers, actually consumers, the people that will buy, purchase, use the services or the products that they are building. So that, that is really important. And that's also Scrum Master role, help the team rethink their relationships with the organization, with the users, users groups, key users groups, consumers, buyers, and so on. And that's where, again, where a lot of organizations get stuck at uh, thinking that they will make all of their teams agile teams now, and then they will magically be sort of agile, flexible, responsive, um, driving innovation, and so on. Now, it's not really like that. It's not more agile teams does not make a more agile organization. You have to rethink, and that's also in my, in my little pocket guide, expressed as a sort of hope, desire by, by uh, and I, I put it by the end of my book. And, and let me read that for you. And that's an expression of what I'm talking about. The future state of Scrum will no longer be called Scrum. And that's sort of happening. Scrum is already the default way of working. Because what I say is what we now call Scrum will have become the norm and organizations have re-emerged re around it. Now, aspect one, becoming the norm, that is happening. Organizations having the courage and the, the, the willingness and the openness and the eagerness to reinvent themselves around Scrum, that's gonna take a little bit more time, it seems. But let's, let's keep going for that hope. Now, what I miss, what I told about, um, is actual engagement. So first of all, I miss environments where people can actually engage. And maybe that's one reason why at a global scale, it seems that the global average levels of engagement in companies is really low. There's an institution in, in, in the United States, the Gallup Institute, they, uh, every couple of years, every so many years, they do uh, research and surveys around the world, countries and employees around the world, to check on the level of engagement, how engaged are they. And, and the scary thing is that um, around the world globally, 
level of engagement is only 15%. So meaning only 15% of the workforce say, indicate that they really engage for the company. Meaning willing to go for it, go the extra mile, do the extra effort, think about it uh, more hard, really go for it. In, in South Asia, where uh, according to the Gallup India's part of it, sort of at the world average, uh, 14%, maybe to comfort you, um, I live in Belgium, and in Belgium, it's only 10%. Now, now the core message is not 10%, 30%, 15% engaged people. The core message is, oh my God, this is actually really low. Only, even if it's 31%, that still means that 69% of people are not engaged. So imagine the potential at your hands if you would start humanizing the workplace, if you would start fostering an environment where people find their intrinsic motivation again, their energy, their love for what they do, where they like to come to work, which is good because we spend a lot of time at work. So more than, on average, more than 80, 85% of the workforce is not engaged. What are we doing to re-engage those people? That's sort of the idea. And, and I believe that's why we need Scrum's DNA, self-organization, creating a, a bounded environment where people can actually, again, do the things that they love to do. Now, beyond that, this, uh, Scrum is all about what I call transparency, but that's just the start. So transparency is the foundation of uh, the empirical process. So in my book, I, I use the house as representation where transparency and then the two walls are uh, inspection adaptation. And, and the roof of the house for me is uh, product and product vision. Uh, so transparency is only the foundation. Uh, you don't want to just make things transparent. You want to create transparency to, so that you can start optimizing for a flow of value. So that's why I said in, in the description of the three accountabilities, product owner, uh, ordering work in a product backlog, ordering that work for value, not just volume, not just utilization, not just to fill people's time, not just to keep people busy, but for value. The most important stuff that we know now, have that built first. Now, you can't really do that or not effectively, and that's, and that's a huge pain point in a lot of um, Scrum adoptions. You can't do that if you don't first consider what is your product. I don't see that happening. So when, when people go, organizations go to whatever they call an agile transformation, they're going to make all teams agile teams. So they, at, at most they collect a lot of individuals, put them into teams together, and then they ha all have to follow the same practices throughout the organization, regardless of context, technology, products, uh, skills, uh, user domain, consumer domain, market, competition, and so on. Just everybody has to do the same. That's sort of like industrializing your scrum to death. So that's not really helpful. So like more agile teams does not make a more agile organization. You will not get all of the benefits out of scrum if you don't think about what is it that we are capturing ideas, opportunities, uh, and capabilities for, meaning product backlog. Who is owning that product owner? Now, what is the product? And, and in, in, in the book, by the way, 97 things every Scrum practitioner should know. There's a part about products deliver value. That's, so that's part two, actually. And there's, there's an article, I'm not going to read it now, by uh, Ellen Gottesdiener. I don't know whether you know the famous lady in product management. And she's got this beautiful article saying, answer this question. What is your product? And most people wouldn't be able to answer that question. Or what it turns out is that what they call product is only a subproduct, a part, a component, a little, a little part of the end product, and nobody's really minding the product. So that's important. So you want to capture business solutions, functions, envision uh, things like that in your product backlog, order them for value, and then have one or more teams turn IDs, options, business solutions from the product backlog into increments via the sprint backlog. So there's a flow of value going through your product backlog, flowing into a sprint and being delivered by an increment. So hopefully that we evolve towards creating not just releasable increments, but more than releasable, valuable increments.
Yeah, we look at increments not just for the, the technical ability to release them, but to their uh, impact that they have, the value that they bring. That, that's for me very important. But key message in my uh, paper, think about your product. Now, the funny thing is, if, if you want to think in terms of value, order for value, you want to start measuring value too. And, and that's important. Otherwise, you don't know what you're doing. You're still blindfolded. So uh, value is an assumption until you actually release. Yeah? So that's one aspect. And you have to translate what do you mean value or what do you mean with value or what do you mean with valuable? And then often people would uh, translate that into things like customer satisfaction, uh, financial figures for the organization. So value for the organization by the stakeholders, often in financial terms, or maybe even cost cutting terms or whatever, uh, sales figures and so on, and value in terms of your consumers. So the two additional uh, groups that I've identified in place demonstrating accountability. So, and you see from the same Gallup Institute, they have found that companies that have high levels of engagement so that have uh, proportionally more engaged people in the company than other companies with uh, fewer engaged people in the company, that their, uh, let's say, value figures for the organization, stakeholders and consumers are remarkably better than other companies. So that means humanizing the workplace is a really sensible thing to do. It will result in higher customer satisfaction. It will result in higher financial uh, benefits or profit. And at the same time, and that's the most overlooked aspect of, of value, the introduction, the adoption of Scrum should not just deliver value to consumers and stakeholders and the organization, but also to the people that are doing the work. So it's value for the teams, consumers, and for uh, stakeholders, but value for the teams. And that's obviously often in humanizing the workplace. Uh, people like to do their work. So value consumers higher value for the organization higher and value for the teams also higher in the sense that there are less burnouts less absenteeism uh, less turnaround of people people uh, quitting from their jobs and so on a lot less so that that's that's amazing so by focusing on um, humanizing the workplace you will have a better workplace for people. And as almost as a byproduct, you would have, um, you would have um, better metrics for consumers and for the organization. So that's, that's quite amazing. So that's players demonstrating accountability. Create an environment, a more humanized environment, so people are invited or allowed or expected even to demonstrate accountability rather than we having to hold them accountable for stuff. And then on top of that, make sure that you regularly close all loops. Now this is um, an old representation um, or a representation of the old way of working where we used to have uh, open loops, meaning we would put something into the system and something would come out and that would be expected to be perfect. A very plan-driven, predictive approach. And a waterfall was actually a sequence of a number of open loop systems, which is fundamentally different than a closed loop system. Closed loop system, you would regularly look at, check out your output, compare it to your input, new expectations and so on, and use that combined with input to drive your system and the next one. In Scrum terms, that means your main input is your product backlog. What comes out in terms of output valuable increments, um, or what comes out is output actually increments. And uh, I would hope that we move towards creating valuable increments rather than just releasable, because valuable means that we are going to try to optimize and maximize and increase the outcome of our output. So the increments are output, we will create output, but the ultimate goal is to look at the outcome that we have from our output. And, and just to be clear, a sequence of open loop systems is not a closed loop system. So don't, don't be fooled. I don't know if anybody has worked with that. There's the V model, for instance, uh, old methodology. I, I still see the V model thinking coming back and then people embedded in some sort of agile terminology, whatever approach, that is not the same as a closed loop system.
Now closing the loops, everybody already knows Scrum in a way has two loops. The big loop, the typical representation of Scrum, two circles. The big loop is what we call a sprint. It's what you're looking at uh, from an external perspective. Product backlog going in and a valuable increment coming out. And then learning from that sprint wise, so sprint off, sprint off, sprint. Now within the system, we have at least one additional loop, meaning the daily scrum, sort of little small circle on top. So that's a, a additional inspection adaptation loop within the bigger inspection adaptation loop. Now that is not enough. That will help us as a sprint figure out the what and the how in a sprint, um, meaning sprint review is about combining what and, and how for the sprint. And by the end of sprint, we're going to check on those things again. What have we done? How did we do that? And we're going to uh, picture, picture that against an overarching goal, sprint goal for the sprint, sort of why. Now to actually go to, to sort of keep closing that loops, you don't need just a daily scrum. You need, and that's very difficult, it seems, because scrum has no prescribed practices that you need to follow within a sprint. But Scrum says that you actually need to have them identified without upfront saying what they should be. Now in a more traditional software and product development environment, what I've, what I've found work really good, and even today is, is a lot based on extreme programming, meaning test-driven development together with pair development or pair programming, um, a continuous integration on top of that, performance testing on top of that, regularly functional user acceptance testing on top of that, and all of that happening, preferably within the loop of a daily scrum, meaning in less than 24 hours, create something, make sure it's tested, make sure it gets continuously integrated, refactored, and so on. And then, so it can be functionally validated. And on top of that, releasing that and measuring for value. So you need additional loops within your sprint. So uh, closing the loops in Scrum, there are probably more loops. Gunther, um, yes. one, sorry to interrupt you. No, uh, it's okay. Yeah, so that just a relevant question that I could see um, from Sandeep. A colleague asked me, uh, is Scrum always associated with complex problems? Can it be used for simple problems? If not, what should be used for solving simple problems? Yeah, well, there's a couple of things so what I see happening. That's why I wrote a paper also that it seems that complexity is increasing. Also in, in non-software IT, whatever domain. So overall, our societies are becoming increasingly complex in all of its aspects and all tasks and all works and all domains. So there's, first of all, I, I, I don't know about a lot of simple problems anymore today. Um, and if, because it means that if a problem is really, really simple, or I, I, I liked to call that clear, but I don't do that anymore because uh, Dave Snowden now has used that term for the, 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 the simplest domain. So simple or clear problems, in a way they don't need any process, any overhead. Just do them, follow the process, uh, follow the task, make sure that they're in rightly connected to each other because simplicity means no uncertainties, no unpredictability. That, is, uh, that are simple problems. So I don't see a lot of simple problems around. Um, and for simple problems, I, I probably am a freak, but I see Scrum being, it's able to, you're able to use Scrum for every type of problem. It just means that you're going to emphasize certain aspects of Scrum more or less. Let me first take the, uh, the, the, the reverse situation where it's not just complex, but total chaos. In total chaos, uh, don't focus on planning. Focus on inspecting, adapting regularly. So focus on closing the, closing the loops rather than sort of planning for a loop. That's in a chaos situation. In a more simple situation, um, a lot of what we have in Scrum might feel like overhead. Um, spend minimal time on, on planning because you already know it, just, just, enough, just enough to get going maybe. But what I think in every type of situation is always useful is stopping by the end of the sprint. So organizing work in chunks of time of three, two, three, four weeks, even in simple predictable work, stopping looking back, reflecting, and, and using our brains to think, 
okay, it's simple work, it might be highly predictable. Still, what did we do? How did we do it? Can we do anything that might us do that work better or make it more joyful or more enjoyable, or whatever? So, so the idea of, of working in sprints and then at least by the end of sprint, reflecting, stopping, looking back, learning, and also learning that you want to do the same, that's in a way also learning as long as you spend conscious effort on it. So that, that's what I've seen, because in a lot of more simple situations, people think that iterations are no longer useful. I think they always are, because you always end up in some sort of dead-end street if you don't regularly stop and reflect. Yeah, thank you so much. And there is a follow-up question on that. I think mm -hmm. uh, you just talked about the uh, open loop system is not equal to a closed loop system. And mm -hmm. uh, question from Fadley around that. Can you please explain more why open space is not ideal for the team? What about if they need to collaborate more with other teams? Oh yeah, open offices are not helpful in the sense, I don't know, in, in, in my presentation, I've got a picture from an open office. So you have open offices, meaning a large landscape full of desks, it's all silent people. And you've got a mix of people. Um, there's no team space, meaning it's full of, of, of desks, tables, chairs, full of very silent people wearing headphones, not talking to each other. When they have a question for a colleague, even in, the, in their own team, it's maybe next to them or a couple of, of seats away from them, they have to use a text message or a mail. That's not helpful. Um, collaborating in uh, solving complex issues means talking to each other, asking questions, figuring out stuff together. Imagine doing pair development. That creates a lot of buzz because you're doing work together. Uh, somebody's creating code while another one is looking over that, asking questions, giving suggestions, hints, and so on. So you're doing online designing, online test, uh, real-time testing, and so on. So that, that creates a lot of noise. Open offices are silent. You're not even allowed to make a lot of noise. And um, people at the other side of the room will look angry because you are speaking up because you have a question. So that sort of um, superficial silence is not helpful. So you need people. And then on top of that, uh, you don't have walls to decorate. You, you, you need to be able to, damn, we've got this difficult situation. Are we going to do it like this or like that? And then go up to the wall or a whiteboard or a flip chart, whatever, and make some sketches and draw stuff and, and make some online things. So create what is called in a long time ago, as the Coburn called that, information radiators. So open offices, you're not allowed to speak. That's not helpful in solving complex problems. And uh, you're not allowed to use uh, the walls or whatever, which is not helpful in figuring out stuff on the spot. And, and even I've called that so... A lot of companies have what they call clean desk policies. If that translates that to our world, they have clean wall policies. So even if you would put stuff on the wall, in the evening you would have to get it off or the cleaning teams would get it off for you. And then there goes your memory. So it creates a lot of barriers to communication and, and intense collaboration. Yeah. Thank you, Gunther, for that. Uh, just a time check. We have five more minutes, so I will yep. let you go, Gunther, for now. Okay, cool. Thank you. I'm, I'm also at, uh, at uh, the last part of this. Um, so closing loop is important, and think about making sure that you have all of your loops uh, present and that you at least close your loops all within a sprint, that you don't have to do additional st stuff after the sprint. Make sure that you can close your loops in the sprint. And there's probably more loops than uh, most people figure. Um, and then the last aspect of uh, the six essential traits of, uh, that should be in your game is obviously the scrum values. So uh, commitment, focus, openness, respect, and courage. Um, so what, what I like to say that scrum is more about behavior than it is about process. I've, I've also contributed one, two articles. One of them is about the scrum values to my book. Given the time, I'm, I'm not going to be able to read it because that would take me at least uh, 10 minutes. But uh, read the book. It's also on my blog, not in that condensed version. But Scrum actually is more about process than it is about behavior because it's about people connecting to each other, um, working together, collaborating, talking, discussing stuff, figuring out difficult design issues, 
figuring out the impact on, on design and architectures and so on. And all of that collaboratively building stuff. So, so the rules of Scrum and also the separation of accountabilities in Scrum, the, a lot of difficulties I see is that people um, don't see them as invitations to collaborate. So we have three separate accountabilities. The separation serves the creation of some sort of healthy tension. That's one thing, but it's also an invitation for those people to collaborate across their specific skills and talents and the traits that they, that they have. So, and Scrum only comes to life when people start using the events of Scrum to collaborate, to discuss, to talk, when they use the additional loops within the sprint to align with each other, to synchronize, to replan, and, and you can't put that into instructions. So that sort of spirited collaboration that is often expressed by people living the Scrum values. So for me, the Scrum values serve, in a way, if you can call that, two purposes. First of all, it's a sort of compass. It gives us direction. Um, whatever we do should be in line or reinforce the Scrum values. But it's also a barometer. So that's the next symbol. It's, it's an indication of the health, the, the, the sanity of our Scrum. So I'm not... Besides, with, with my little book, putting the Scrum values back, back on the table, because nobody had described them since the first book of Ken Schrader and Mike Biddle in 2002. So in 2013, I described them again. Um, I made it, tried to make it tangible, actionable, what sort of behavior is attached to the Scrum values and how that is aligned, how that should fit the underlying principles of Scrum. So Scrum's DNA, empiricism, self-organization. But Scrum in a way it doesn't start with the values. The practices of Scrum, doing Scrum, acting, taking action with Scrum, sort of goes hand in hand, two should reinforce each other. So don't, don't get stuck in the false dichotomy, practices first or values first, they go hand in hand. But in a way, over time, as you start doing Scrum, even, even by just focusing on the practices, in a way you should see those values come to life, become more prominent over time. So that's how I look at the values. That's why in my classes, in my courses, in my workshops, I almost never do explicit exercises just on the values because the values are expressed through behavior, through the practices and the rules of Scrum, and certainly through the, the six uh, essential traits. And, and that's sort of my closing for the session of today, and I, I'm still around if you have some questions. So the six essential traits are, should be embedded, ingrained in the way you play your game. And I've tried to summarize how that is. You can have a look at it, but embrace the simplicity, use it to sort of unfold the potential of Scrum, um, form self-organizing teams, form self-organizing units, not just limited to maybe the Scrum team, but even on top of that, ecosystems and so on. Um, use empiricism to manage your work, um, use transparency to make all clear, but certainly to make clear the flow of value that you're looking for, and, and uh, demonstrate accountability, close your loops, and, and in a way, ultimately, show that you understand and live the Scrum values in your behavior. Because, because um, it's not what you say, it's what you do. I meet lots of people that have beautiful words, but I don't see that in their actions. And that makes it not believable, not credible. So it's what you do, it's not what you say. It's not how you look, it's what you do. So uh, thank you very much. And, and um, I want to invite you to help me keep humanizing the workplace with Scrum. That means we need to keep learning, keep improving, and in a way, keep scrumming, because Scrum is all of that. Thank you, Gunther. Um, in the spirit of time, I would like to go ahead with one question, uh, which is, which is okay. from one of the participants. Uh, you know the Scrum adoption is proliferating, right? In the last two years, it got proliferated and there is a lot of hype that everybody is doing Scrum right. But mm -hmm. most of the time or off of the time, they are not doing it right, especially yeah. without the DNA. So as a Scrum caretaker, what is your take on that? And there is also a question, interesting question. What would be your advice to other passionate Scrum caretakers? 
to protect Scrum. Yeah, that's a hugely difficult one. It's funny because I was I was in touch with uh, uh, somebody in India, by the way, this week. And we were discussing the, the, the problem of uh, classes and courses and so on. And one of the things that I, I asked me about, why is this happening? And one of my observations is, and that's been going on for at least two or three years, Scrum, in a way, has turned into a commodity. It's the impression that people think that, oh yeah, Scrum, everybody's sort of doing Scrum. Something that looks like Scrum, using the terminology of Scrum. So Scrum is turning into a commodity. In, in that sense, can they use that Scrum is for a lot of people not sexy anymore, not attractive, it's not exciting anymore. It's just what we do. So they, they compare it to like going to the shop, picking a box from the shelf, then quickly reading the instructions and then start applying that. And they think, yeah, we now do Scrum. And, and the huge difficulty, let me use that as an example. So I don't have a solution for that. The difficulty that I'm facing, and let me use my classes as an example, so I have a lot of difficulties attracting people to my classes. And one of the observations is that there's a lot of people out there that they think they know it already. And, and even call themselves experts and so on. And certainly nowadays in, in the COVID uh, crisis, honestly, um, I think there's a lot of people that may have read one book, I don't know, read a paper, read a scrum guide, and they call themselves experts and they start offering classes and so on. And so undermining in a way professionalism a lot. So the difficulty I have is the following. I have difficulties attracting people to my classes because my classes are not for free. That's an additional problem. And because people think they already know Scrum, they don't have to attend the class or go to a webinar or read a book, whatever they think they know it. Although that every, every single person, no matter the level of experience they have in my class, had had several eye openers and rediscover that Scrum actually is really exciting and not sort of the boring stuff that they know. Now the difficulty is once you get them into your class, into your um, atmosphere, let's say, you can show how exciting and, and, and brilliant and lovely Scrum is and they go out totally convinced and, and totally re-energized. But the difficulty is that getting people to come into your atmosphere and, that, and that's difficult. And I have no idea how to do that because it's like a complex adaptive problem. It's, 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 that is the problem, is the current atmosphere where we have to do a lot of things online, courses, workshops, whatever. And, and the, the term online seems to invoke the idea that it should be for free, which is sort of difficult when, like me and, and maybe you think that you're trying to make a living out of that. So I do, a, a, my website is for free, my YouTube channel is for free, my papers are for free, I, I join webinars for free, so I'm trying to make a little bit of a living out of classes. So that's a, that's a huge problem. So you've got all this, um, not to be too negative, sort of pirates out there. Yeah, I've read a book. Everybody wants Scrum. Let me quickly um, re-market re, re myself as a Scrum expert, having sort of done one, one, one project with Scrum and read a book and I, and I can start doing classes and for free and create an additional certification scheme and so on. So, you know, the commodity thing, the free thing, a lot of, uh, and, and it's, it's a way that's, that's difficult to wrote that uh, I think Venkatesh, where you and I certainly agree on, we go for the difficult path. And, and that's, that's, that's the only answer I can give. Uh, keep promoting Scrum the way it is designed to be. Keep, keep highlighting that, keep pushing that. Um, make sure you don't get fired. That's not helpful either, but look up sort of your freedom up to maybe up to that point. Yeah, that's a good way of summarizing. Thank you very much, Gunther. In the spirit of time, um, it was a fantastic webinar. I would like to thank you personally for all the time that you spent here. Your contribution to the community is phenomenal. There are some mountainized con contributions that you are given to the community. Uh, on behalf of TriScrum and the crew member, I wanted to extend my gratitude and Thanks a billion for making it up for us you know, on this webinar. Thank you. Thank you for having me, thank you. And uh, good luck with try Scrum and, and keep, keep pushing. I, I call this Scrum Caretaker because I care not just for Scrum, but also for people. So okay. let's, let's, let's keep humanizing the world, please. Thank you so much. And uh, to all the participants uh, that joined, thank you very much for your time. And these are the upcoming uh, webinars. 
uh, with the vision of humanizing organizations. We have uh, wonderful speakers lined up. Please refer tristem.com slash webcast to reserve your seats for the webcast. And once again, thank you so much to the panelists, the participants, and Gunther. I look forward to seeing you and having some learningful conversation in the near future. Okay, cool. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot, Gunther. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.